This video is going to go through questions 1 through 7 on your Keystone Algebra 1 practice review. Um, so if you want to jump ahead, if you need to see a certain problem, you can do that. This first video is going to be questions 1 through 7. Um, starting at the very beginning, let's order the following numbers from greatest to least. Make sure on the keystones that you always read the directions. So we want the greatest number first, and then going down in order to the smallest number. You have a calculator on a keystone, so use it. I would put them all into decimal form. We have 8.4 repeating. I would find out what 25 divided by 3 is. Put that down. 8.3 repeating. Find out what the square root of 72 is. Find out what 35 divided by 4 is. It may help you to write them in line on top of each other. So I have 8.4 repeating or 8.444 continuing on. I have 8.333 continuing on. I have 8.485 and 8.75. So if you're looking for the number that's the greatest, start from left to right and find where they differ. So when I look at the first numbers, they're all tied. They all have an 8 in the ones column. Let's look at the tenths column, the column right after the decimal. When I look there, comparing just these numbers, I can see that this is my next greatest number. That means that 8.75 is going to be the greatest of the group. And remember where that came from, 8.75 came from 35 over 4. That should be your first number in your list, which means A can be, can, can be ruled out and B can be ruled out because I know the first number has to be 35 fourths. Okay. After that, I'm looking for the next greatest number. Well, in the tenths, I can see that there are two numbers that have a 0 .4, 8.4, 8.4, 8.4. So of those two numbers, these ones right now are tied, Look at the decimal, look at the next point after that. So look at the hundredths column. We did the tenths, they were tied, let's do the hundredths. Compare this four with this hundredth spot, which is eight, and I can see which one's the next greatest. Whichever one's bigger in that column will be the next greatest. So this was my first place. My next greatest number, four or eight, it's going to be this eight, so this is my second greatest number. Where did 8.48? 8.5 come from? That came from the square root of 72, so that's my second one. So the square root of 72, this is checking off. Let's make sure the others are in, in order. Then after that, it's going to go back to the one that was tied. Since this was second at 8.48, the next lowest is 8.44, leaving 8.3 to come behind as the smallest number in the group. So it's going to be the 8.4 repeating and the 8.3, which came from 25 thirds as the smallest. Your answer for the first one is C. For the second problem, which of the following inequalities is true for all real values of x? My recommendation for any problem like this would be to try plugging in a negative number, try a positive number, and try zero. We're looking for one that's true for all of them. So let's start with the beginning one. x cubed is greater than or equal to x squared. Is this true for all values? Well, when I try a negative number, and I would keep it simple, guys, so let me let x be negative 1. If I cube negative 1, I want to see is that greater than or equal to negative 1 squared? That's what I'm checking. Well, negative 1 cubed is negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1, which gives you a negative 1. Negative 1 squared is negative 1 times negative 1, which is just 1. This is not true. So A can be ruled out. It is not true for negative numbers. Let's try B. 2x in parentheses squared is greater than or equal to 3x squared. Again, you can plug in a negative, a positive, and a zero num and zero to see if it holds true. Now that's just holding, showing that it holds for that case, so you want to use your logic too. And this is a great problem to use your logic on. Remember what this means. Let's simplify this. 2x is inside of parentheses getting squared. 
So I'm allowed to give this exponent to each part of that base on the inside. 2x squared is 2x times 2x, or 4x squared. Is that greater than or equal to 3x squared? Well, they both have an x squared, so I can divide out x squared on both sides. Those cancel, and I'm left with 4 is greater than or equal to 3. Ask yourself, is that true? Is 4 greater than or equal to 3? Is it sometimes true? Is it always true? Is it never true? Well, 4 is always greater than or equal to 3, so b is going to be your 1 that is true for all real values. When you solved it, you found out that this was an identity. This works out to be true for all real values. Let's try c. If I try to solve c, I have an x squared and an x cubed. They have different exponents, so I can't, I won't be able to cancel things out as I did before. But I could divide, I could divide, or I could plug in numbers. It's your choice. So, you know what, on this one, I'm going to try a negative, a positive, and a zero number. If I try a negative 1, well, 3 times negative 1 squared is greater than or equal to 2 times negative 1 cubed. Let's see if that's true. Negative 1 squared is 1. 1 times 3 is 3. Is that greater than or equal to negative 1 cubed is negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. That works out. Okay, try a positive number now. Let's try x equals um, 1. 3 times 1 squared. Is that greater than or equal to 2 times 1 cubed? Well, 1 squared is 1. 1 times 3 is 3. 1 cubed is 1. 1 times 2 is 2. Hmm, but this seems suspicious, right? Because it seems like if I cube a number, it could grow at a quicker rate. Try another one. Maybe try 2. 3 times 2 squared is greater than or equal to 2 times 2 cubed. Let's try this. 2 squared is 4. 4 times 3 is 12. 2 cubed is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. It didn't work here. So this is not going to be true for all values. And the last one, D, you could also try that as well with plugging in numbers or solving. With D, you end up seeing that if x, if you solve this inequality, if you FOIL this out and solve, you will get down to x is less than or equal to 3 halves. That means that it's not true for all values because if x is greater than 3 halves, it will not work. And you could try plugging in a number to see that. So my answer for number two is B. Number three, choose the correct comparison of the numbers below. Again, I would use your calculator and I would change them all to a decimal. So I have 0.46. I know with a percent, I just moved the decimal over twice. So I have one and four hundredths. And the five fourteenths, I'll have to use my calculator for five fourteenths comes out to three, five, seven, one behind the decimal. So when I'm comparing these, I like to line up the decimal points and then I can see the order that they need to be in. Now down in the directions in these ones, it doesn't say which order to put it in, so you just have to see which one is true. I would write it in your own order and then look at your options. So which one's the smallest? Well, I see 0 .3571 is the smallest, which came from 5 fourteenths. That's less than the next smallest is 0 0.46, which is also less than the 1.04, which came from 104%. Now that you have your order, look at the options that match that. I'm going to notice that nothing matches that in the order that it's in, so turn it around. Write it backwards. If I read it from this way, 104% is greater than 0 0.46, which is greater than 5 fourteenths. Your answer is C. Number four, last comparison of the numbers, same thing. I would write it as a decimal. So 16 seventeenths is 0.94117 when I use my calculator. And the percent, to change it to a decimal, I just divide by 100, which moves the decimal over twice. So I have 0.998. Lining them up and comparing them, they tie right here at the tenths column. They both have a 9. 
But at the hundreds column, I can see that this percent is more than the fraction, or the fraction is less than the percent. So I need to put in C. The second part of this first section is radicals, and you need to simplify radicals by looking for perfect squares. So you can simplify a radical by breaking this up into a product of perfect squares. The square root of, 60, of 640 can be split up in a lot of different ways, but I know that 64 is a perfect square, and it also is a factor of 640. So figure out what you need left. Well, it would be 64 times 10 to get you the 640, and now evaluate what you can. The square root of 64 is 8. 8 comes out of the square root. The square root of 10, 10 is not a perfect square. The factors of 10 are 2 and 5. Neither of those are perfect squares. So I can just leave it as 8 square roots of 10. The square root of 640 simplifies down to 8 square roots of 10. Look for those perfect squares. Number 6, which value of x makes the expression 3 times the square root of 53x equivalent to 21 square roots of 53. Well, notice the difference between these two. I'm going to multiply 53 by something on the inside of my square root. But I end up keeping the square root of 53 and the square root of 53. So the only difference is that I have a 3 on the outside and it becomes a 21. Think about that. 3 times what will get me this 21 over here? Well, it must be a 7. So now, remember that you want to get a 7 on the outside, but that doesn't tell you what x is. So if you're circling C, you're rushed. x has to be something that when I take the square root of it, it gives me the 7 on the outside. What does x have to be? Well, x has to be 49. If x equals 49, when I take the square root of 49, I can pull the 7 on the outside, and I will have 7 times 3, which gives me the 21. So D is your answer there. Again, you could try it 3 square roots of 53 times 49. Remember, do what we did on the last problem. Split it up into the square root of 53 and the square root of 49, because 49 is a perfect square. Now you can evaluate this. Actually take the square root. The square root of 49 is 7. That can come out. That can come out in front. Sorry, I don't know why I put an equal sign there. And this is all being multiplied. So it's 3 times 7 times the square root of 53. The square root of 49 is 7. And then I can simplify this to 21 square roots of 53, which is exactly what I wanted. All right, this last one requires some logic. The expression of square root of 85 times x should be farther simplified for which value of x. Remember, we can simplify radicals when there's a perfect square inside. So I need to think about what number I could put there so that it has a factor that will give me a perfect square when I multiply it by 85. It helps if you think about the factors of 85 first. So 85 is divisible by what? Well, I can break 85 up into 5 times 17 which means I really have the square root of 5 times 17 times something, whatever I want that x to be, which means I want x to be a multiple of either 5 or 17. I want x to have a factor of 5 or 17. So start ruling some of these out. Does 59 have a factor of 5 and 17? No. Does 94, is it divisible by 5 or 17? No. 3, definitely not. 235, ooh, it ends at a 5, I like that. I could split that up into 5 times what? Use your calculator, it would give you 47. Which means if I put in 235 for x, it would allow me to simplify this farther because I would have a 5 times 5, which can be grouped as a square root of 25, and the rest of it can stay inside the radical but this can come out. This can become the square root of, I'm sorry, this can become five square roots of 17 times 47. So your answer for the last one is D.